Hello everyone, we're back with another episode of the Telegraph Rugby Podcast. After another wild week for rugby off the field, as all eyes turn to the state of the professional game in Wales. I'm Ben Coles and I'm joined in the studio by Charlie Morgan. Hi Charlie. Hi Coles, wild is right. Wild is certainly right, isn't it? And joining us virtually on a lovely big screen is Charles Richardson. Hi Charles. Good morning everybody. Uh, before we dive into the issues in Wales and, and chat about our special guest as well coming up in today's episode, um, Charles, where are you and what are you doing there? Uh, I'm currently on the outskirts of Newcastle. I'm on a very special mission up here to do some work with the Falcons this afternoon, um, a few interviews which will um, appear in the Daily Telegraph and on the Telegraph Sport website, may, hopefully in the very near future, so um, keep your eyes peeled for those ones. I mean, what a tease that is. You've not even identified who you're chatting to. That is, I'm, I'm intrigued. I'm intrigued. Charlie, are you intrigued? Quite right. Even quite Compa- Company man, gonna, <laughs> keep the intrigue. Are you gonna, are you gonna prize it out of me? <laughs> no, 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 no. Maybe no, later. No. You, maybe later. Let's see how the rest of the pod goes. Um, how did you two fill your void this week? I'm in no Six Nations. What did you do? Where were you? What did you see? Up in the glorious East Midlands, I was at um, Saints Saints Sale with a few England guys. Released to action to in a bid to impress. Didn't didn't happen that that way for everybody, um, as we can get into. Uh, yellow card after 14 minutes for Manu Tuilagi. Um but subplots galore and more so when we saw the squad that came out later on the, ne- the next day on the Sunday yeah certainly Charles what about you where have you been so I've been at a, uh, a rugby reunion for my former rugby team at university in the northeast um, it was very very good fun but as you can all probably hear my voice is a semitone lower than what it usually is um, but I have, I did spend last night frantically catching up on all of the rugby that I missed this weekend and what a weekend it was. And I also, just for good measure, watched an absolutely diabolical game of rugby <laughs> on the French West Coast uh, between uh, bordeaux Begle and uh, Clermont Auvergne, which finished 18-9 and there was not one try scored. So thank you very much for those two teams for completely ruining my Sunday evening. Is that a Sunday night primetime thriller in France that's just gone down the pan a bit? That doesn't sound very impressive. Yeah, it's supposed to be the big money match. Well, it wasn't, there was no big money last night. <laughs> very good. The, we're going to have to talk in this episode a lot about what's going on in Wales and, and with the professional game. And we're going to hear, hopefully, from, from Josh Turnbull, the Cardiff captain, to get a player's take on what's happening. But the headlines last week were quite shocking, weren't they? That There was a good chance that the game between Wales and England would not go ahead. Charlie, just in terms of the uh, how last week panned out, and obviously that's such a big headline, uh, uh, we're going to dive into it a bit deeper, but how shocked are you that it sort of got to this stage? Shocked, and I think fantastic reporting from Alex Bywater of the, of the Mail, and that was yeah, the definitely. bombshell story on either the Monday or Tuesday. You forget, but you, you expect these Six Nations fellow weeks to be reasonably quiet with the odd kind of line about team news and selection and which players are going back to their clubs to impress as we've just touched upon there. But no, this was huge, but it was, you know, people around the Welsh game will have feared that something, a nuclear option, because it is a nuclear option. Obviously the players don't want to be doing this and it's a, it's an indictment of how far along the road the situation has got that we are here. You don't, I, I fear that the people within these processes and um, fans of the of the regional game who've been following that will have seen it coming a mile off and it but it we really are at a pinch point with it Charles do you remember a time where fallow weeks used to be quiet and we could sort of reassess and the six nations and there wouldn't be any major news I mean this is seismic stuff isn't it I mean I know I know Netflix haven't been allowed to film a lot of the Welsh camp but they've they've decided to pitch a documentary at a really interesting time for the game haven't they yeah to be honest I'm, I'm struggling to remember a time when rugby was quiet. Now it's just it's just one thing after another. I mean, we, when we see midweek Ealing apparently in talks with the Ospreys about a merger um, to go and play in the URC after the RFU um, said that the Trailfinders don't have the the requisite facilities to go up into the Premiership for next season. So the only team that can be promoted is is the Doncaster Knights. I mean, is it all heading towards an, an Anglo Welsh league, a British league? Um, Simon Massey Taylor's poured cold water on that hasn't he and says that's just not a live option but we're going to have to see what these options are aren't we because the English PGA we are keeping told that that is a a, a pretty vital point of its renegotiation too so hopefully all of these threads Mm. that seem seriously unclear and muddy hopefully they become 
slightly clearer in the next in the next weeks, months, and the and the obviously the timeline for Wales is even shorter than that. I mean, on the field, on the field, the Premiership is working as we saw this weekend and as we've seen numerous weekends. But off the field, um, it, it isn't as much. Obviously, we had the news at the end of last week about Leicester and how they're requiring thirteen million pounds to be to be invested by their two um, by their two owners. And you know, the the circular um, additional information that was distributed to the shareholders on that front made for very bleak reading. Um, as far as I understand it, it's not quite it's not quite dire straits. For Leicester, and it, obviously, it's great that they do have two people who are so committed to them and willing to invest thirteen million pounds. But you know, it doesn't. You know, something isn't working at the minute. Charles, to answer your question, there was about forty-eight hours after the twenty nineteen Rugby World Cup final before the Saracens salary that cap was exactly broke. I think that was it, wasn't it? That was the last <laughs> time. That, we, that was the last time we collectively. It's when the snowball started rolling, paused for breath, and were able to kind of relax for a little bit. And ever since then, it's a. Uh, it's been chaos. Um, we have got a special guest today, which is going to be Cheslin Colby, the Toulon and Springboks winger, which is very exciting. Charles, what, what are you excited to hear about from the uh, from the fantastic player that he is? Uh, I'm willing to hear about um, uh, his move. His move. You don't see you don't see many sort of big money moves. Obviously, he moved from Toulouse to Toulon, um, and I think there seemed to be. Uh, there's something that went on there, and, I, and I'd like to know a little bit more about that, actually. Oh, OK. Charlie, what about you? Quite interested to see what he thinks of Ealing's acquisition of the Ospreys, actually. I, I'm sure that he's got tons of opinions on that, actually. And yeah. Do you know what I'd quite like? I'd like to know how many times he's watched himself stepping Owen Farrell in the 2019 World Cup final. Because when mm. you, um, just to give you a, a little look behind the curtain, if you ever tweet something about how Owen Farrell's done something pretty well, you get a reply from South Africa which is that gif as, a, as though being stepped by Ches- Cheslin Colby is such a disgrace when he's probably done that to a thousand people what South Africa the nation just, yeah yeah, just yeah like that's the, it, yeah. the, the official, official government account Blue tick, is, yep. is harassing you on no, Twitter no uh, various accounts but <laughs> right let's dive into the whale strike news because it's the story that's going to dominate the next few days and, and sort of hovering a bit of a cloud over what should be a really interesting game in Cardiff against England this weekend Okay, guys, so this, the story, as far as we can tell up to this point, because it's been developing over the last few days, so hopefully this won't have changed too much by the time this podcast goes out. The sort of reasoning behind this disagreement between the Royal Shrub Union and the players and the prospect of a strike is because budgets are still yet to be finalised for next season for the, for the regions so that they know how much money they have to spend on player contracts. Now, so that means the players out of contracts are sort of wondering whether their futures are going to be secured, whether they're going to have to take a pay cut. And it's got to a point where, even though those players might n- not necessarily be international players, the whole squads, the whole senior Wales team, everybody's mucking in to make sure that actually the players get a fair deal and that they're not going to be screwed over by this. Really fascinating period in, t- in terms of the political sort of wranglings because there's so much going on, but also you just really feel for the players. I, I think we were watching... Lent the Dragons, was it, on Friday night? And, and one of the centres went off. I want to say Jack, Jack Dixon. Jack Dixon, yeah. Who spoke really, who's spoken really well in the week about, about the uncertainty and, and the angst that was causing. And because he's out of contract at the end of the season and Steph Hughes, his centre partner, was then speaking afterwards saying, this is exactly what we're talking about because it's players who don't know if their futures are going to be secured who are now picking up injuries. It was actually a, f- a pretty horrible flashback to the Wasps and Worcester situation of last season when, it came, when it, we were chatting about their sort of insurance and how and whether they were going to be able to play and what it would mean if they got injured I think it just really highlights how perilous this situation is for players at the moment completely and the point you make there it was the the friendly in Glasgow wasn't it that that Worcester can because they totally openly said and this was when Steve Diamond was sort of leading that hashtag together didn't they they were really trying to live that but he said look we, we can't ask these players to to play in a game when it's not just the next two weeks that they could miss with an injury, if, if it's more serious than that, it's a total life change that they'll have to go through. They'll have to change career potentially. They'll be, you know, thrown into just utter chaos. And these guys choose to be rugby players. Um, of course they do. Um, but they, the game has a responsibility to them to give them some sort of clarity on their future, some sort of strong support network around them 
from a from a professional point of view. And it's that limbo. I think it's seventy players overall across Wales that are out of contact at the end of this year, and um, it just must feel like a horrible black hole that they're staring into. In terms of, there's a soft deadline that seems to have been set for Wednesday, by when this needs to be resolved. It, p- players, Wales players, striking in that game being under threat is basically the most extreme move they can do. You can understand why they're doing it, but more importantly, if that game doesn't go ahead, it hits the Welsh Rugby Union so hard in the pocket because think of how much money they're relying on to come from that game and think, therefore, about the after effects of that on the entire Nine, game nine million? Yeah. I mean, nine, nine million? That was extraordinary. Is that, the, is that for the bars on St Mary Street alone? Or is that for the actual yeah. crowd taking us? <laughs> because it's, it's such a notorious day, that. But That's it, just the old arcade. Yeah, yeah, it actually is. If we sort of run through... I think what seems to have happened at the moment is that there are now a few conditions which have been set by the players which they want to see passed in order for the game to go ahead as planned. And and a couple of those, based on hearing from Malcolm Wall, who's the chairman of the Professional Rugby Board in Wales, the Professional Rugby Board, should point out, is made up of regions, the Welsh Rugby Union, and has independent board members. He was saying last night that actually two of the conditions are sort of being met. So one of them is for the 60 cap rule to be binned which apparently was under review anyway since Warren Gatlin returned to coach Wales, but is now now actually looks to be on the way out. I think we should actually chat about that because we, we haven't been able to talk about Welsh rugby for the last, what, a, a decade or so without discussing the 60-cat rule and the effects it has on players and how it sort of limits, limits transfers and where players can go and players making their debuts in the Premiership and then having to move back to Wales in order to continue playing for the national side. I mean, Charlie, do you want to jump in there? What do you well, make well, of that? I think one one thing, just to go back to the reporting that Alex Bywater has done, one thing that stood out to me about his story on, I keep getting this wrong, was Monday or Tuesday. This is just how, this is just how much of a kind of washing machine, tumble dryer this feels like. Um, but it, one point that came across to me was how much claustrophobia there feels for those players in and looking and seeing that they can only represent Wales because of the contra- because of the situation they're in. They can only represent Wales if they stay at one of these regions when they look at somebody like... Um, well, all situations are different, aren't they, Lewis? You, you, comparing Lewis Rees Summit with, with Nick Tompkins, for instance, is, is a bit different. But when you see those guys that are kind of with a bit more solidity around their futures, um, and, you know, the Wales jersey is a is a fantastic carrot to keep keep these players at a region, but it will only go so far when they're weighing up their livelihoods and they're weighing up their... Um, quality of life that's what it comes down to yeah absolutely and Leicester Leicester fans who had been praying for a miracle that Tommy Raphael could remain at the Tigers well they might have they might have just had one we don't know what the next incarnation of the 60 cap rule is going to be we understand it's going to be scrapped now don't we but that they might bring in something else but yeah it looks like Tigers fans uh, might be um might have got their miracle. Yeah, and Gloucester fans are Lewis Rees-Summit as well. Because the, ev- yes. ev- pretty much ever since he made his debut with, with those wonder tries a couple of years ago, the whole talk about him was, this is amazing. How long are Gloucester actually going to be able to keep him for? And they tied him down to that long-term deal, didn't they? And the assumption was after that expired, he would be moving back. But there's you know, there's a chance that he doesn't have to go. The other sort of condition which seems to have been agreed is that the players have a, a, represent- a representative from the Welsh Rugby Professional Players Association goes into the professional rugby board. I mean, that seems to make a lot of sense. The one area where things seem to be tricky, and based on watching BBC Scrum V last last night, the main issue seems to be this idea of sort of player performance bonuses and win bonuses. So apparently these make up 20% of contracts, which seems like a lot, I think, we were all saying before we started recording. That's a big chunk of a player's income. Players want this removed so that they have more guaranteed money, which seems fair enough. The professional rugby board currently wants it to stay. What, what do you two make of that? Dif- so difficult, so difficult in the in the in the landscape where these these regions are sort of um, fighting fires. And I think um, Josh Turnbull made that point actually on the program that we are. It's almost as if they're fighting. He didn't say. It, I'm not. I'm putting words in his mouth here, but it felt like. They're they're fighting with one hand behind their back for their livelihoods. If certainly, if twenty percent of their contracts are linked are linked to results, um, it's it's. I just think too, and there's a piece on uh, Brian Moore's done his column on on um, his memories of uh, leading a strike in in 1991 with England. I think to even comp- 
contemplate a strike would need a certain degree of de desperation and to mobilize it to speak to the press about it um that's a whole new set of hoops that have been jumped through as far as a player's frustrations and and desperations and for us to have reached that point in the middle of the six nations with all eyes on this fixture for for various reasons anyway feels so um sad i would say well, Charlie, you've actually been speaking with Cardiff captain Josh Turnbull. He's been quite vocal in the last week on social media regarding this whole situation. Let's hear what he had to say. Players have got mortgages to pay for. They've got families to look after. Um, and, of course, um, families, your wives and your girlfriends are going to be asking questions as to what's happening, what's the plan. And players haven't got an answer at the moment because they, they generally don't know. Um... And that's, and that's probably the, the, the darkest point, really, when, when you've got people, uh, young lives that rely on you, families that rely on you, and um, to say that you don't know what's happening, um, from, from, from my perspective, it just, there's been a complete lack of empathy shown by the PRB and by the WRU um, trying to get this, this, this deal across the line, and it's taken far too long. Uh, Last night I got, uh, I got on Scrum 5 with Malcolm Paul, uh, who's the chairman of the PRB, and to the chairman of the PRB to you know, say this, this should have been sorted ages ago. Well, it's his job to make sure deadlines are set and deadlines are uh, hit, and he has done that. Uh, so, you know, from the right person to be doing the job, um, you know, because they've been kicking the can down the road now for 80, well, between 18 and 14 months with st still no long form agreement in place but it appears as though the 60 cap rule has has now been scrapped which is one of the, seemed like one of the pinch points with you guys as players C can you spell out to me why that's so important um it, it's important because you're you're being squeezed financially with the offers you're getting from the regions because the money from the the WIU is not enough it basically feels like a restraint to trade like, because there's clubs in England, France, um, Japan, possibly, that want to offer players contracts um, who maybe don't have those 60 caps. Um, and I, I believe that the 60 cap rule needs to go now. Um, basically, um, basically, it's, it's, it's done its job. It's kept the, the golden era of Welsh rugby in Welsh rugby. As, as to say, but now there's such a gulf between those senior players with 60 plus caps and the next the next crop who are on, let's say a lot of them are under, you know, between 10 and 20 caps. One question you asked of Malcolm Wall um, on BBC uh, Scrum 5, uh, Josh, was what the long term plan was with regard to getting regions competitive. It, are, we, are you satisfied that there's an answer there? No, I wasn't. And I thought, I, I didn't think he, well, you list, you heard it. Did you yeah. think his answer was acceptable? I didn't. You know, it didn't, it didn't give any vision as to how they want to make these clubs, um, other than in the short term, cut the player numbers to save their money. It didn't really highlight um, how they're going to go about making regions successful in, in the years to come. Um, now, at the moment at Cardiff, um, you know, we're we're the best place Welsh region, and you know, you know, they're saying that our our, our budget is going to be cut by around about two million next year. So how how are we going to be able to compete with that? Over two million, sorry, two and a half million. Yeah. How are we going to be able to put a you know field a team? Um, you know, we're just we're just about on the edge of um, URC playoffs at the moment. Okay, we've got a last 16 tie in the BCR in the in the Challenge Cup, um, but that's having having two and a half million cut off your budget is not gonna is not gonna do do you any favors. If anything, it's gonna make you worse off. Um, and this is where I think we need the WIU need to have a good look at themselves in terms of the way they uh, what they what they're funding, what they they're putting their money into. Because at the end of the day, the players are the product, and you get 
you get players uh, 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 competing or team regional teams that compete in the knock on effect is that Wales are going to be competing the, the general support for the nuclear option which is which is players striking has seemed palpable does that say everything about where we are and does it say that there's a there's an appreciation that this situation is about far more than a Six Nations game between Wales and England. It's about the future of the game in Wales as a whole. Yeah, definitely. And, you know, like I think Alan Wynn said it in the week, you treat someone bad enough for long enough and you're going to end up in a situation like we are. Um, you know, and one of the reasons we are where we are is because the PRB uh, believe they can go and do what they want. Um, they have, there's been no consultation or transparency through the process the last 18 months since they've been working on the new this new model that they want to get in with with the players or a representative from the players so our WRPA rep um, you know the, since the PRB has been brought in there's been no uh, consultation until the very last minute and then by that point um, it can sometimes be too late well it, 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 sometimes it gets to a point where you know the players are going to you know they have to stand up for themselves and if if a strike is what is needed on the on on Saturday, England Wales biggest game of the year for for both teams. Then you know this it's going to have consequential. Um, it's going to have the severity of it is going to be quite 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 big, Absolutely. probably for the whole game in Wales. Absolutely, you have cl- you have close friends, teammates, past and present in the Wales squad. From your understanding, Josh. Are we going to get a game on this weekend? Would it be fair to say that the next 48 hours are crucial in that? The, the players have stipulated um, their three key points. The only other point I'd add to it is that the, the financial uh, finances need to be re-looked at. There, there needs to be more money invested in the pro game. Um, you know, you, you, you can't be going from seven, you know, you can't be losing two and a half million pounds worth of, um, worth of uh, money because this, we can't compete. Um, you know, you only have to look at someone like Leinster, how well they're doing. They're probably spending, you know, on their senior squad between eight and ten million, ten million quid. This is purely just me just speaking out loud. I, I think they will get to a sort of agreement. I cannot see the game not going ahead, given the financial implications, given what it means to all of the regions and and all the players and to the governing body. Charlie, what about you? My my. Inkling at the time when, when Alex's story came out was no, as it's rumbled on and as actually, importantly, the players will have received a lot of support and seen a lot of, seen a lot of support from fans that really want this um, resolved because as much as it would be catastrophic to the, to the WRU to lose that fixture against Wales, what would be catastrophic to the players is to play the game and then limp through and not have a, um, not have a viable agreement over the next, however, however the next, the next, the next set of contracts for them being flimsy and them not giving them the support so there's a real standoff there I think and and it feels like it's the longer they're going on without it without there being um resolutions it just feels it feels more and more real and we're now what are we five days out six days out from the game five days out um yeah it feels it feels like it's in the balance yeah I agree I, I was just gonna say I think there's a point to be made that obviously the headlines and the stories are about money, but but it's not actually about money, if that makes sense. It's about the, the uncertainty for players, not knowing what they're going to be doing, how they're going to pay mortgages, how they're going to feed their families, how they're going to be, where they're going to be living, where they're going to be playing. I think that that's actually the core of this. Obviously, the, there's a financial element to it. I think even players would accept that money in the game is really tight in Wales and that, yeah, there might need to be some sort of streamlining somewhere, but actually, it's it's the uncertainty about their futures that and how that's affecting their mental health. I think that is really important and and sort of at the core of this. Completely. Ma- Malcolm Wall-, Wall made the point that, um, and, I don't, and I'm absolutely certain, I think, when he made this point that he didn't want to patronise the players, and I certainly don't want to make- patronise the players when I'm making sort of a, a, a supplementary point to the one he made, but he said that the proposals, one problem is how the proposals have been put across to the players, and that reminded me of, I did an interview with Matt Garvey, who was standing to be the... Um, head of the RPA from player's side he didn't he wasn't successful in that election Christian Day um, has done it but he said he made this point that that really stuck with me which was that in rugby changing rooms perception is reality so actually a lot of these and another sticking point that Alex um, covered which has subsequently been cleared up was that players could be loaned to other regions without much of a say in that matter Um, so when that gets communicated around a changing room 
and the details aren't necessarily right. It doesn't matter that the details aren't right because that's what the players think and that's what builds the animosity towards the policy in general. Um, Malcolm Wall made the point that he was he was desperate to... He's going to hold, as far as I understand it, of a series of town halls um, with players. So I guess sort of um, collective meetings with players where they can get across these sticking points of um, that are causing angst and make sure that they are absolutely spelled out definitively that is absolutely vital and that what will help that potentially is this seat on the board that the that the players want and that and that is an, is something also that chimes with what's going on in england that's what a, a, a real um aim of the rpa is to make sure that the players are officially represented they are they are involved in a lot of discussions but that official representation is important Warren Galland actually spoke about the prospect of a strike last week, so let's just hear what he had to say on the matter. The, the stance that they're taking in terms of uh, wanting to get um, some resolution about the, the issues that they have, um, but I think there's a lot more involved in terms of, you know, a lot more things at stake in terms of, um, you know, ensuring that that fixture does take place. And so, um, but, you know, that's. Like I said, I'm supportive of, of the players and the things that they're trying to trying to do. Um, and my role is just to prepare the team for for next week. He's certainly come back at an interesting time, hasn't he? With, with two two tough losses to start his campaign, and now this strike action. Um, let's leave that there, and we'll potentially move on to chat about England and just the sort of shape that England are in. So England named their squad last night ahead of facing Wales in Cardiff this weekend, assuming the game does go ahead. Uh, a few tweaks to it, including the return of George Ford after a few minutes of sale on his return from that injury he suffered in the Premiership final last season. Charlie, what did you make of him? It's quite a small sample size, but he's straight back in the squad, isn't he? A very small sample size. So he's had, he had a half in the Premiership Rugby Cup against Bristol, um, in which sale got absolutely pumped. And then he came on yesterday with half an hour left Sale had just conceded a try um, to go from to have their lead reduced from twenty seven seven to twenty seven fourteen, but he came in, he came in um, with Sale having been reduced from fourteen men to thirteen men. So essentially, what I'm what I'm saying is he came into utter bedlam basically, and um, he couldn't kind of get Sale over the line. But there were some nice touches. Um, Topically, a few of them were little kicks. So, nice little grub of it just on the edge of the 22 to earn a five metre scrum for sale as James uh, Ram uh, cov- uh, carried the ball back over. Lovely restart to set up sort of the last gasp after sale had gone behind, set up a last gasp, go at uh, the win, and then another cross field grubber. Just, just really delicate touches that we all come to kind of expect from George Ford. Um, important probably to Stress that Finn Smith picked up a dead leg, which might have might have kind of hurried his. Although we know that Steve Borthwick has been in dialogue with Ford, and we know that he's a big fan of Ford, particularly his his ability to impart pressure and keep pressure on it. it it's fantastic talking to Ford about the game. We always say this, and he's so articulate. And what he also what he often says is that playing, and you never know whether he's having a little dig at other fly halves when he says this. So again, wouldn't want to put words in his mouth but he, he talks about the little moments that govern moment, govern momentum swim, swings in test matches so when you find grass with a kick and a, and a fullback has to get across and therefore their clearance is pretty poor and, and a team have got momentum on the kick return those are the moments that he's a real um, real master at and I think England have really missed that It's a lovely boost for sale isn't it I know Robert Dupree has been having a great season but if you now have Ford available as well they've got two incredible options there um, Dupree, really important to stress that mm. Dupree was really good at the weekend again. Charles, in terms yeah. of what it means for the uh, fly half situation, which seems to be perpetually complicated, uh, how how do you think this is going to play out in the long run? Are we going to have Ford and Farrell? Are we going to have one of Farrell, Ford and Smith? Are we going to have Smith? Uh, how is this going to work? I mean, yeah, it does look very uncertain, doesn't it? And um, predicting the future in in terms of the English midfield, well, you know, you'd be you'd it, you'd be better off trying to predict what news story is going to come out of rugby next. I think you'd you'd have better better joy with that. What what we can say, I think, for, for certain, is that um, it doesn't bode too well for Marcus Smith, and I think the pressure is on him now. You know, if 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 he's 
he was dropped to the bench for the Italy match, and now George Ford has come straight back into that squad. Now, it, it, after as, as as Charlie said, how, how much rugby? An hour is that? Is that a, is that a total? The cumulative amount? seventy minutes. Yeah, pretty much 70, seventy minutes of rugby. George Ford in eight months. George Ford is straight back in. So clearly, he is front and center of Borthwick's plans and prep for for England going forward in the match day 23 even if he's not starting and and you're not going to have Ford Farrell and Smith all in a 23 I think it's an eddyism left over in my mind that certain players you just plug straight back in it doesn't matter how long they've been out for is that is that one of Eddie's yeah and another one was yeah. you can only have two frontline fly halves or two frontline scrum halves I forget in a training <laughs> squad because of rotations on training that's another thing that kind of Borthwick just isn't kind of abiding by that, is he? Those theories are sort of gone and he's got Ford in with Farrell and Smith and, and we'll see who comes out on top. And But I, I do think it'd be punchy for Ford to come straight back into a match day 23. I totally agree with Charles, though, that Marcus Smith is, is the most at risk there, if only because, and I know it won't be popular, but, but the Ford-Farrell axis is a potential live option um, when you've got those two in a 23. I don't think... Smith's place in the World Cup 33 is potential, is at risk. Uh, yeah, I think you can fit all three of those guys in, and especially given Farrell's ability to switch across there. But yeah, more uh, more midfield permutations, that's what we need. One of them needs to work on covering fullback a bit, I, th- I think. Just, well, Ford, to, just I know, is I, another option. This Ford was an idiotism, but Ford, we were talking um, at Franklin's Gardens about how Ford went to nine um, mm. in, a, in a game that Leicester won really comfortably over uh, Northampton in the Borthwick era and he basically terrorised Saints with about three box kicks in a row that were pinpoint and they and Leicester worked their way up the pitch and then he got a drop goal from a goal line dropout or a 22 dropout I, 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 was, I was at that game and he was mesmeric yeah I think Boyd absolutely mesmeric somebody, somebody said that Chris Boyd sort of gave his post match and just went yeah I mean well we lost by 30 points but they had George Ford, so what are you going to do? Some player. Um, uh, Morgs, you, so you would have also seen Manu Tuilagi, who was uh, lively, but not in a good way? Yeah, um, so he, I think he had three touches. He was pretty well contained with the first carry, and then his second carry actually played a really delicate, really nice pass to Rob Dupree for a cross-kick for Aaron Reed's try that got Sale going. And then his third try, uh, sorry, his third touch, sorry, um, buffeted away Fraser Dingwall um, and he had Finn Smith hanging off him I think and then just shot out an arm and copped um, copped Tommy Freeman one on the jaw and it looked quite bad live um, I think Claire Hodnett was the TMO and, and alerted to Ian, Pe- Ian Tempest and everybody knew straight away um, including Manny Tulagi he was grimacing straight away he went across to Tommy Freeman as he went off the field to just check he was okay which he was um, it looked a little bit like somebody really striving to to make a point, as Alex Sanderson had sort of foreshadowed in the week, saying that Tuilagi was simmering and unfortunately saying that he was kind of, I'm going to have, have to have a word with him in case he does boil over and he hurts someone, that, which is very much words that precede unfortunate events. But um, yeah, I think we'll see a three, may, somewhere between a two and a four week ban. Um, and I think that, I think that the indications were clear that Borthwick was looking beyond him anyway, um, and and Ollie Lawrence's performance against Italy was in that sort of thirteen attacking role. I know he was wearing twelve, but he was with Farrell and, and Slade operating as those two distributors that England like, and that and that system of set plays that they use. And Lawrence was excellent there, really sparky, kept going all the way through the game, and as we said, influenced the game more as it went on. Um, so yeah, I would say. A bleak times ahead for Tulagi is his obviously his future at sale beyond the summer is uncertain too. So we'll see how that shapes up. Sanderson did say that he's confident that Tulagi will repay him. So we'll see how that goes. There were a few of the, there were there were a few games gone soft tweets from that from that Manu Tulagi red card on I just, Saturday. Oh, that's and, and I, red card that always has it, been. It, red cards, it's been, it's it? been a red card in in rugby for, for forever. That that yeah. sort of manoeuvre I would say it looked very very bad it looked suspicious at the time and on review it looked really bad some and of those some of those choice. some of those ones where the fending can look terrible when the timing's out and um Lucan Salad Kai Lotto 
was sent off in, a, in the last time I was at Franklin's Gardens actually at the end of the game against La Rochelle basically exactly the same happened he was sort of trying to fend having just broken one tackle trying to fend another mm. defender coming across and the timing was wrong and, and his his forearm went into another player's jaw and you know when when the decisions are being largely not not totally but largely based on outcome it's it's only going to be one and one kind of thing happening and as I say Tui Lagi saw one replay and sort of knew the game was up I th- I it was think- the active launching wasn't it it was the sort of active yeah. launch mm. that, that that was done for him I mean I, I have no doubt that you know Manu Tui is not a dirty player I have no doubt that he didn't mean to sort of elbow Tommy Freeman in the Adam's apple but that it, but it was very clumsy and very reckless um, and Ill, ill-judged, and it deserved a red card every day of the week. You're right, You're right, Charlie. It does seem like he is being phased out slowly by Steve Borthwick. It's probably one for the old disciplinary hearing um, roulette fans, actually, because I know he's had... I was just checking his previous suspensions. His last one was for that no-arms tackle on George North in 2020, for which he got four weeks. He's obviously got the... He's got the 10 week here on his record for punching Chris Ashton, but that's something very different and very long ago. I sort of wonder whether he... Could be could be your standard three, could be four, could be five. I mean, Salakai Lotto got four, I think. Yeah, um, I actually saw him before kickoff, sort of walking around in the you know, have a, either doing corporate or just but they're watching. But um, yeah, I, so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. I'm sorry to say, I don't know whether the tackle school will apply because it's sort of contact area school, isn't it? That's true. <laughs> Is that a new a new no, school no, no. that's being <laughs> set yeah. up that we don't know? It's new school that's in session. <laughs> Be. New world rugby development. I mean, in terms of the rest of the squad, the the reason that Eddieism was probably in my mind was about Ford was also because Laws is is back and and Tom Curry are back as well, obviously from injuries. So how how much do you tinker with that side? Do you bring do you try and bring both Laws and Curry back? Do you use Laws off the bench? Do you start Tom Curry? And notice that Ben Curry's not in the squad anymore, which is a fairly brutal turnaround, having started against Scotland a couple of weeks ago. Ch- Charles, would you reckon they'll do? With Laws, it does seem like he's definitely a lock now in this England setup, doesn't it? Yeah, I think I think both Laws and Curry will be on the bench um, against France. I think if 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 they're not in the plans against for Wales. the match date, sorry, against Wales, apologies, yeah, yeah against Wales on Saturday. Um, if they're not in, if they're not in the plans for the twenty three, then why are they in the squad? What was the point in having them there? You know. I think Curry will probably come onto the bench for Ben Earl, who has always looked very enthusiastic and eager off the bench, but maybe hasn't quite um, achieved as much as he would have liked off the bench. I think that's I think that's fair to say. Um, and I think Laws will come onto the bench for Ezekwe, and he'll want to try and keep Itoje and Chesham together because they've been going very well. Um, and then the back row, well, the two flankers, Willis and Ludlam, along with Chesham, have probably been England's three standout forwards, really. So, um, and Laws hasn't played barely at all for Northampton. I, we know that he's he's class and that he can turn it on in the, in the click of a fingers, the same as Tom Curry, but it's just different step up from the Premiership to international and I think just easing them back in, maybe with a view to reintroducing them into the starting 15 for France and Ireland if they go well off the bench might be the more sensible option there. Yeah, I think you're right. You'd, you'd feel desperately for Lewis Ludlam actually if he was the one who made way because that happened in last year's Six Nations after he played really well against Scotland at Murrayfield and, in, in, and there weren't many England players that played great that day and he's been brilliant this, in this Six Nations as well hasn't he so far I, I just fear that he eventually might be the one that makes way I fear less for him actually just because okay, he's had a little bit of time at, two reasons he's had a bit of time at eight at the end of the Italy game um, so he's clearly either willing to have a look at him from the start or during a game there um, and he's been so prominent in the line out, so that obviously balances out anything they're going to have. They're going to do there. Yeah, say Laws came in for Johnny Hill officially, so that would seem to sort of seal that he he's look, being looked at as a lock. I I just wonder whether Don Brandt might be the one under a little bit of a little bit of pressure too there, um, because as we sort of trailed on this um, podcast, didn't we last week? I. I think Borthwick will be intrigued about a Curry Willis um tandem in in the back row. Um and he likes that four stroke six on the bench with Ezekwe. I think I agree with Charles. I think Laws suits that quite well and would his energy um would would hopefully for England solve those solve those kind of slow slow finishes that they've been having. 
And just on the number eight, if you're not going to have a, someone who is going to carry the ball outstandingly well at eight, because they're seemingly that in in the mind of Steve Borthwick at the minute, in terms of his selection, that person perhaps is missing. Don Brandt has looked solid, but I wouldn't say he's looked particularly anything more than solid. And he's not a sort of really big, heavy duty ball carrier in those tight areas. Then you might as well almost play three flankers, really, and just really attack the breakdown, really attack those wide channels. Um, and again, in, in a very Borthwick fashion, stick to super strengths, concentrate on what you're good at rather than rather than what you're not good at. I got called out called, called out last week justifiably but not not mentioning Sam Simmons at all. He's he's back in he's back in the mm. squad. He's there. Um one thing I would say again about the the makeup of the back row and, and who England pick at in the back five of that pack. Wales have traditionally kept the ball in field haven't they against England and tried to starve them of that line out uh, platform so we'll see how that plays out. All to be revealed with that England team selection later in the week. Uh, but next we're going to hear from one of the biggest stars in the sport, having chatted to Springboks and Toulon Wing and Cheslin Colby. Let's see what he's made of the Six Nations and get his ideas on a few other topics as well. We're delighted to be joined now by Cheslin Colby on the podcast. Cheslin, how are you doing? I've uh, been uh, all good. Uh, thank you. Hope you. How are you doing? Not too bad. We're not bad at all. Just gearing up for uh, for another busy weekend in the Six Nations. Have you had a chance to watch it? You've been enjoying the games. Yeah, I've gotten I've gotten to watch uh, the first two games um, of the Six Nations. Quite quite an interesting opener uh, to it. To be quite honest, um, yeah, obviously a lot of expectations with with the French team to back up what they they they've they've done last last season. And yeah, just uh, on the Scotland team, uh, it's playing phenomenal rugby, which is which is great to see. It feels really wide open at the moment, doesn't it, with the way Scotland are playing and and having France and Ireland in it as well. Um, it, just with yourself and with Toulon, I saw you had a good a good win at the Velodrome on the weekend over Toulouse. How was that for you? Yeah, no, obviously it's it's for me personally it's just great to be back on the field um, with a with a long lay of of injuries last year. Yeah, for me it's just just as I said, great to be back on the field and and go out and and have fun and enjoy myself again. And yeah, this week has or last week has been really special. Obviously, a massive week uh, for for me and I'm sure for some of the boys too. Playing against to lose um, is always massive. It's one of the best teams in the top 14 or probably in Europe as well. So yeah, it was was really special for me because it's the first time I've I've gotten to play against Toulouse and my old teammates since I've left uh, the past year and a half. I've I've missed it due to injuries or being away on on international duty. But um, yeah, was I was really looking forward to to the challenge and and playing against my old teammates. Um, yeah, good to obviously get the win at the end of it. That makes it much more special. Must have been quite a strange feeling coming up against players who you've yeah. been alongside for so long. That was always strange. Um, I've, I've had a few chats with, uh, with some of the boys in the team uh, during the week and just said like how, how weird and how weird it feels to be coming up against them uh, on the weekend. Um, but yeah, we definitely had some some crack ups throughout the week and and during the match as well <laughs> with some of the boys. But yeah, that's 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 rugby. Um, Things changes all the time, man. Yeah, it was it was just uh, great to to be on the field and be part of that special occasion, especially in Marseille, um, playing against a good quality team. We don't often get transfers in mid-season like that, and, and especially for such a big fee when, when you made the move. How did that sort of how did that sort of come about? Yeah, yes, it's probably it's probably not the way that I would wanted it to to have happened, or the way I wanted everything to to end. It's probably still a lot of people that that hate me for what I've I've done. Um, but you know, um, sometimes you you can only control the controllables. And at the time, I was during the international period with with the Springboks and all the negotiations at that time uh, as happened then and. After the internationals, I had to go back uh, to to Toulon, where I obviously signed uh, for the for the next or then the next three years. So I didn't get the opportunity to, to go back to Toulouse the way I wanted to and go pay my respects to 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 everyone that's that's welcomed me um, since 2017, and that's been there for me in during my four and a half years at Toulouse. Um, 
so yeah that's one part that i do regret um the way everything has gone and not saying goodbye the way i wanted to i honestly wanted to go back there face everybody face to face and 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 say my thanks uh to everyone and say my goodbyes as well and then embark on 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 my new journey with Toulon. but you know like those those kind of things I just couldn't control because everything just happened so fast. Everything happened during the international period when I was playing, and yeah, I just had to get back on back onto a plane and jump back into France and, and join my my new club to launch. So yeah, uh, obviously, and a decision that I had to make, uh, a personal one uh, for for myself in 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 growing and and learning. And and just getting out of my my comfort zone uh, as well. I think uh, to to lose was really special for me. I've learned so much. It's developed me to to the player I am today, and I've learned so much. But I just felt that I was becoming more comfortable with with the way things were going, and I just wanted to get out of my comfort zone and just challenge myself at a time. And my decision was basically based on 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 improving myself as a player and and challenging myself and and, and going out into a new environment and <clears throat> just find that 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 hunger again and yeah just obviously been 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 a roller coaster not also the way i wanted everything to to happen when i was when i've signed and arrived for the first time in toulon coming over here being injured not playing as much uh, so yeah there was definitely a lot of frustration um along the way but yeah as i said those those things are, are just uncontrollable and and it happens and it happens for a reason i saw that just a couple of days ago you you were sort of having to play down speculation that you might even move to japan as well so so the plan is definitely that you're staying in toulon until until the end of i, I think it was the end of 2024 is that right <laughs> Yeah, no, you're hundred percent spot on. I'm, I'm staying in Toronto till twenty twenty four. Yeah, that's that's just one of the sad things about about media. Um once somebody just puts out something there, everybody gets on the wagon and, 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 and rides with it and like nobody's came up to me and asked me like, Listen, is this really true? Is this happening or or, or what's my perspective about everything that's out there? And yeah, I've gotten so many so many hate along the way when that was released um but yeah I, I just thank the club for 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 also being there for me and and just yeah um like whenever i needed to speak and and ask questions they were always there to to answer them and 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 just give me that bit of comfort um knowing what is out there is i mustn't take it up up and mustn't just affect me and 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 my game and yeah sometimes it's, it's challenging because sometimes you're walking up in the streets you're just in public and people come up to you and they're like oh I see you leaving to you're leaving to Japan now you've just been here for one for one year and you're already leaving so yeah some it was challenging but like I knew I knew and I know what I want up until now and where I want to be and what I want to achieve and that is to to just get onto the field and and play the best and the most rugby that I can um, after being out for 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 so long. So yeah, I'm signed in to until 2024, and that's where I'm gonna be be at. And whoever knows what happens after 2024, um, might end up staying in Toulon might leave or whatever the case is but that that's the next hurdle for 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 2024 my focus for now is plainly on 2023 and the top 14 and the next uh challenge that comes with that it, it, you had so much success at, at toulouse and you've had so so much success in france that that many people will forget that you you played for a long time for western province and for the stormers and and there was a there was a time where it seemed that they weren't even sure what sort of the best position was going to be for you, or, or, or pundits were coming out and suggesting you move to <laughs> scrum half. I remember that really clearly because because look at you now, and look how much is has changed. How, how do you look back on that time before you moved to France, where where before I guess you had your sort of breakthrough? Yeah, no, obviously, um, yes. My 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 main reason at a time 
um, leaving South Africa was obviously started a, a family and all the the bad public that I've gotten due to due to my my stature, my my size, and wanting me to change positions and and all of that um, was was disappointing because I, I I felt at a time that I was playing quite well where I was where I was based at either wing or fullback and contributed to to the team that I played for with St. Paul and or the Stormers. So, yeah, it was quite disappointing, but also a, a challenge that I accepted and, and made peace with that I'm always going to be getting the, the negativity regarding my, my stature and, 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 and all of that. So, I was all about proving people wrong at the time. Um, uh, that it doesn't matter how big or small you are. Um, that this game is is made for each and every each and every person, no matter how big or tall you are. Um, so for me, that was my challenge I faced each and every weekend. Um, with with media, with coaches, um, people not not having the belief and 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 trusting me on what I can do. And yeah, at some stage, everything has turned little by little. And yeah, I got the opportunity back in 2017 then to 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 leave for for France uh, uh, to lose at the time, and it was opportunity for me to to go out and experience a new a new country, a new culture, uh, get out of my comfort zone, and and just build my name up again in 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 a different place and. I must say, since I've I've gotten here, it hasn't but it hasn't been easy. I couldn't speak the language at all. So my first game I got um, got to play like all I knew was right and left in French. And other than that, the coaches <laughs> told me just go out on the field and just play and do what you can do. And yeah, we won't judge you from that because we understand you don't you don't un- you don't understand French. You don't understand the rules and the game plan of of the team. So just go out and and play. And I actually had one one of my one of my good games uh, as a, as a debutant. Uh, score managed to score a try, get a line break or two. So yeah, uh, obviously then my confidence was was booming from from the start. And I just think uh, getting. To, to lose just the people, the players we had around each other between experience and and young players was was, was good. Um, I've I've gotten to learn so much from a lot of the French international players and 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 the young guys that were in the system for for so long, and they were just the ones uh, to make it so much more easier for me. So, yeah, the challenge coming over to France was was challenging the first three to six months but after that I've, I've, I've found my, my feet and managed to to start to to learn the language and speak and interact with people not just inside the, the rugby circle but on the outside as well and that's a way I've I've learned to to speak um, and and communicate with people um, so yeah it's been it's been challenging but a challenge I, I don't regret at all um, Making the move, coming over to France, and 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 then playing my rugby abroad. The point about stature is really interesting because it, it feels like we're at a point now where where smaller players are actually are thriving. I'm, I'm thinking about yourself. I'm thinking about Angie Capuazzo at Toulouse, and then Italy, who's who's probably a similar height and is doing really well. Does it feel like the game has changed a lot in that regard in the last few years? Yeah, I hope it's changed. <laughs> but yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a firm believer. If 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 you're good, um, and you get the opportunity and make the most out of it, then you deserve to be there. So yeah, uh, I just think no matter whatever the stature is of a player, if he's good and he's proven himself to to perform at at a certain stage, um, then he deserves to be there. So yeah, um, obviously for me, I'm I'm happy to see. A lot of smaller and smaller players coming through and and seeing them go up at whether it's club level or international level. As me as I mentioned, uh, Angel has been incredible for Italy, um, and yeah, you can see he's definitely enjoying his rugby, which is which is great to see. And yeah, hopefully, us smaller guys can encourage a lot of young youngsters out there to 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 take up the challenge and just. Uh, enjoy themselves um, at doing so and not worry about what other people think or what they're going to be judging you on uh, about 
being too small or making mistakes. Um, this game, no one's perfect. We're all going to make mistakes. But I just feel sometimes whenever you're smaller um, and you make a tackle error or or any little thing which is an error, people just jumps on you and gives you a lot, a lot of trouble. But whether it's a big guy and he misses a tackle, it just seems like, okay, it's fine, it's normal. But when you're a small guy, I think it's just 10 times worse whenever you get the, the bad negativ negativity from the public. Yeah, that's a really fair point. I, I think that probably is subconsciously something that people do, for sure. And with, um, with the Six Nations, you mentioned watching it, what Angie's been doing. Do you sort of look at the Six Nations? There's always been talk about South Africa potentially joining it down the line. We've seen South Africa teams now in the Champions Cup. What do you think about the idea of South Africa in the Six Nations? Is that something you would like to see at some point? Yes, yeah, there's obviously been a lot of articles and everything going out about South Africa training the Six Nations. Uh, I think if it does happen, it will obviously be massive um, and it changes the whole scenario regarding the, the, the Six Nations. But I think as for the Springboks of South Africa, it will definitely be be amazing uh, if we could be a part of the Six Nations who play against top countries each and every weekend when you're part of that competition. Um, so yeah, it will definitely be uh, be amazing if it does come off one day. Uh, but yeah, who, who knows what, what might happen. Um, it definitely will change a lot. Um, and a lot of people have a lot more to say uh, if it does come off that South Africa joins in the Six Nations. When you look at the the results that um that Ireland had winning that series in in New Zealand and, and France had that unbeaten year last year as well. Does it feel like maybe the Northern Hemisphere Northern Hemisphere sides have just got the edge at, at the moment going into this Rugby World Cup year? Yeah, yeah, definitely I think Ireland and France are probably the two favourites going up into the World Cup. But prior to that, if you look at the competitions they they, they play in as well, um with the top 14, the Heineken Cup now, and then the URC as well. Um, they've been dominant in, in all of those competitions. And um, yeah, I think rugby over here has, has definitely grown since since I've joined in, in 2017. And a lot of players has come over, brought more experience and brought a lot of knowledge uh, to the game uh, in France. So yes, yeah, it's becoming more competitive and more more challenging, which is which is good because you want to come up against the best each and every weekend and, 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 and measure yourself uh, against uh, good quality players. You played alongside Anton de Pont for so long at Toulouse. Is he? It's, and I guess he's one of those, those similar guys in stature who sort of just can dominate a game, and we've, we've seen that. And just how is he quite deceptively strong as a player? That seems to be one of his qualities that people are starting to <laughs> I appreciate. I, I honestly don't think that guy's human, <laughs> because yeah, <laughs> uh, then he can he can literally do everything you ask him to do, and he'll probably do it way better. Um, yeah. The yeah. funnest thing that I can remember of Antoine is like whenever you get in the gym, he doesn't do any gym. He just goes out to his rehab and and that's about it or any core exercises. But in terms of gymming, gymming, like maybe a little bit, but not like going heavy as, mu as most of the other boys. I just think he was just naturally gifted. Um, in all regards, um, when coming to when it comes to rugby, um, yeah, it was was obviously incredible to 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 play alongside him when I was at Toulouse and and see the way he's, he's obviously grown uh, over over the years. So yeah, I'm, I'm obviously really happy for him and and the way he's going. But yeah, he's he's def definitely not human at all. <laughs> but um, <laughs> Yeah, he does put in a lot of hard work and he's just one, one humble human being uh, on and off the field, which is just incredible to see. I just want to finish up by asking you about South Africa um, and, and the Springboks and just how they're, sort of, how they're sort of going, how sort of confident you feel coming into this year. And, and just also a quick one on Razzie because there was a lot in the news, obviously, about Razzie at the end of last year and, and his ban. I, I guess maybe starting with that, how do you sort of... What do you sort of make of, of Razzie's suspension and, and what happened? 
No, always it just shows you how, how much he cares about the Springboks, how much he cares about South Africa, um, and he just wants the boys and the team to be to be treated fairly. And he would go out of his way to to make sure that 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 is the case. Um, I think he's very passionate about the rugby, and I'm sure each and every person up to date uh, will know that by now. Uh, that's who Coach Rassi is, and. Uh, Man, he's just an incredible human um, on and off the field. Um, I've gotten to obviously know Coach Rassi when I've, I've started playing uh, and even in 2018. Um, just his sense uh, of the game, his thinking is, is out of this world. Um, I haven't been part of a, a coaching team where there's so much detail and, 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 and so much or a lot of thought that goes into preparation and and the way you see and analyze other teams like yeah he's, he's learned me quite a lot and I, I take my head off to coach coach Rassi for 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 obviously coming in uh, at a difficult time and and managing to turn uh, a lot around in quite a short uh, period of time uh, obviously leading into a World Cup uh, in in 2019 so yeah um, really a fantastic. Uh, coach to, to, to play under and, and, and get coached by and just a phenomenal human uh, off the field to uh, cares, a lot, cares a lot about the players uh, their health uh, their families and just wanting the best for them and yeah, as as everybody knows the the, the band that he's got in was, was all for for the Springboks uh, and, and, and the players at a time but yeah um Really exciting and a very good good guy to to have on your side and 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 learn from at the same time. Yeah, Chesley, thanks so much for your time. Glad to see you back on the field, and uh, hopefully we'll catch up with you soon. Uh, thank you so much for, for your time as well, and it's lovely to to chat to all of you. Let's have a quick look at the other games going on this weekend. So on Saturday, we've also got Italy against Ireland in Rome. Maybe one of those games a few years ago, Charles, where Ireland might have considered tweaking their selection and and you'd certainly maybe like to see guys like Ross Byrne maybe get a start and maybe Craig Casey and Gavin Coombs in the mix as well. He'd be good as well. But can you not really afford to do that anymore because we've seen enough from Italy, do you think, to suggest that you need to take them as seriously as possible? Absolutely. I mean, I think Owen, um, Andy, Owen Farrell. I nearly said that was that's a that's a, that's a swift career that's change a, that, for Owen Farrell. That's 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 crept under the radar this week. Hasn't there's been a lot enough, going on. That. Doesn't happen enough. No, we should do no. that more. Really. Owen Farrell. Owen Farrell now coaching Ireland and captaining England at the same time. No. Um, you know, Andy Farrell even said as much after the France game. He was asked this by by um, the journalists in attendance, of which I was one, about can he. Um, can he afford to make changes for Italy where, you know, once upon a time he would have done and he said no. He was very blunt and he just said, no, I, d I don't think we can. I think we're going to have to go, we're going to have to go full throttle. We're going to have to go to Rome um, as if we're going, you know, with the same mindset as if we're going to Paris, Edinburgh, Dublin or, or, or Twickenham. Um, so, yeah, I, d I don't think there'll be many changes. Obviously, Ty Byrne is, um, is out for the tournament, which is a great shame. So they'll obviously have to have a rejig on the, in the back five of the scrum. But, um, yeah, I, I think, I think it'll be a cracker, actually. I, I really do. I think, I, I think Ireland will win, but I think Italy, Italy will push them like they push France, like they will push them. Byrne's been great, hasn't he? But it's nice to have someone mm. with all the experience of, of Ian Henderson just there. I know he came off the bench in that France game and, you, and you'd figure that he would be likely to start. Charlie, do you sort of hope that we'll get... that? It was a bit of a step backwards for Italy, it's sort of in the end at Twickenham. Back in Rome, could they cause Ireland a few problems and could we see a similar game to what we saw when France went there at the start? Love to watch it. Um, they will... They're, uh, they're becoming a high-possession based team aren't they Co capable of sort of going through phases staying patient and then breaking down sort of waiting for defensive errors Negri was huge watching that game back mm. um, on a second watch um, so it's sort of two two sides that kind of both both enjoy sort of going through that the phases and, and, and applying pressure that way uh, they're just they're just slowly sort of out of nowhere sort of becoming your second favorite, everybody's second favorite team in in the in the um, in the tournament. So, pa Paolo Garbisi was back, wasn't he, for Montpellier off the bench this weekend? So, 
there's an interesting selection call there mm -hmm. um and see how kind of he he influences things having having started his test career so impressively that could be massive couldn't it because i think we we thought that while tommy allen did quite well in those opening two games if they'd had garbisi there that might have just taken them up a level and actually might have helped them close out the game against france the way that he's been playing recently um it's just so much depth in the irish squad that I know they talked about that they were going to manage Sexton's groin injury last week, but actually, you know, is it worth giving Ross Byrne a go? He's he's sort of looked at the business, and they might have they might have solved. We talk about England's midfield being the question that comes up over and over again. The the Sexton backup question might have an answer as well. Yeah, I think that's so pertinent looking ahead to the World Cup because that they're going to have to to get even a semi <laughs> get even a semi. Um, comfortable it's not even going to be comfortable is it getting a semi-sympathetic quarter-final they're going to have to win both of those group games against Springboks and Scotland um, and you wouldn't would you back Sexton to play all 160 minutes of those I don't think I don't no. think I would no so does that Ro right, Ross Byrne who now seems to be the second choice there needs to be as assured as possible you mentioned Craig Casey earlier Colsey really really big fan of his and I think that looking forward if you know their profile they've they've nailed their colours to the mask with the, the profile of scrum half they want in, in Jamison Gibson Park and I think Craig Casey fits that um, really smoothly so yeah I'd like to like to see him get some game time as well and, and potentially start Charles Scotland to go to Paris on Sunday and I can't wait for it it's going to be an absolute screamer what do you what do you feel what do you expect what are you excited about well, it, just on excitement, I think this is probably the most exciting Six Nations game in terms of anticip pre-match anticipation that Scotland have been involved with for years. Like this is this is serious now. You know, they're, they're going to Paris, having won there two years ago against a French team that that were you know conquered, in, albeit in a classic, but they were conquered by Ireland. So France are on the back foot, having limped home against Italy, having been conquered by Ireland, and Scotland have won their opening two games. And they could be going they could be going <laughs> they could be going to Paris having won their well, they could be leave Paris having won their first three Six Nations matches. So that's and, and you have to say that on current form at the minute, France will obviously be favourites at, at home with the with the talent at their disposal. But it wouldn't be a massive shock if Scotland won, would it? I don't think so. I was just looking up some quick stats. So the, the when they won against Wales a couple of weeks ago, it was the first time they'd won the first two matches since the 1996 Five Nations. They've not won back-to-back -back games in Paris, this uh, very reliable Six Nations website tells me, since 1928. I mean, we're talking about crazy stuff here. But, yeah. but it's not crazy because they've got such a strong side. And I think with France... Uh, I think we sort of had a feeling with France that actually they wouldn't be that that down that disheartened by what happened in Dublin because actually no. they were going to lose eventually. They had a few games in the autumn where they sort of scraped through. Do you think that as a result of that we will get sort of a, a quite a strong response that a few I've areas would have been fixed? I think so, but I think this is a crucial match for them. I think this is, if anything, this sort of now is more important than that game in Dublin because, yes, we didn't think that they'd be too disheartened by what happened there because you've lost one of the greatest ever Six Nations matches and, to be honest, on the whole, you played pretty well. Um, but then if you lose at home to Scotland on the back of that, questions are going to be asked and suddenly it does it does start looking a little bit more worrying. Um so I, I think Sunday is massive for them. There does need to be a response. I do think there will. And obviously, Jonathan Dante at inside centre is looking like he's back fit now. He'll come back in. He's he's massive for them in a sort of, you know, you, you saw the difference that Ollie Lawrence made to that English midfield. Well, Dante's the same. He just gives that focal point. He gives direction at 12. And he gets them on the front foot. France, France against Ireland, against Italy. And in, in the autumn, when I've watched them, when they are not on the front foot, they look a little bit bereft of ideas, frankly. They are not a good side at regenerating momentum. It all has to be very quick and very efficient. Once they get efficiency and speed, they look, they're look they virtually unstoppable. But if you stop that, and as Ireland did, to be fair, with some pretty impressive chop tackling uh, in the forwards, if you stop that, then all of a sudden it becomes very... Because it becomes very difficult for their magicians to work their magic, I think. The, king, the king of Paris in Finn Russell beating France at the Stade de France would be really tasty and a great narrative. Can't wait for that game on Sunday. We're just going to wrap up now by answering some of your readers' questions which you've kindly sent in to us. 
Okay, we've got three readers' questions to finish up, and the first one is from Daniel. Um, Charlie, I'll come to you with this one first. He says, do you think on the back of everything that is happening in Welsh rugby, it will galvanise them or negatively affect their chances against England? I, th I think galvanise them kind of from an emotional point of view, for sure. It's whether how much that disruption has impacted on their preparation. We know, as we as we kept making the point in, in previous podcasts, in, England supporters needed patience because their preparations were going to be mitigated because they'd had so few training sessions under Steve Borthwick and, and Kevin Sinfield and the new setup and the Kevins as well. I think England will. I think I certainly feel confident in the in the in that coaching setup that they will continue to improve. It's whether Wales, the distractions that have impacted Wales, and they are only human. And as we say, this uncertainty must be crippling for them. Um, and, and we know how much anxiety it's inducing, how much that impacts their kind of ability to put together a cohesive game plan because certainly against, um, they came back to, into the game against Ireland after being stung by Ireland's really fast start. Against Scotland, they sort of hung in there, hung tough, didn't they, for the first 50 minutes or so and then the floodgates opened and you, and you saw sort of that raggedness. The raggedness was there throughout in attack but they kind of fell up, fell away in defence as well, and that's kind of a mark of a team that is maybe held together by emotion and and little else as far as a coherent plan. So it's it's whether they've got that as well, I would say, because I expect England to improve, and it would be whether Wales can ride that emotion. They've got players like Dan Bigger who just adore the, the game. It, he was phenomenal. One of the best individual performances I remember from last year's Six Nations was him against um, France in, in Cardiff. He was he was awesome. Um, so him conjuring something like that would help, um, but it's going to be difficult. Dan Bigger, who I don't know if we've heard from since he provided Scotland <laughs> no, with yeah. bulletin board material before the game at uh, Murrayfield a couple of weeks ago. Sorry, Charles, do you have a point? Yeah. No, 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 not at all. Um, well, that's good, because I've got a question for you, which from Andrew, right. talking about sort of the, the test number rates sort of around the game at the moment and whether England have missed the boat, and he says... I'm thinking of Doris, Surveyor, Fagerson, hyper-athletes who wouldn't look out of place at flanker. It feels like England still want a bulldozer. They still want Jasper Visa. That which leaves the question, what is Don Brandt? Is he kind of a bulldozer? Is he a hyper-athlete? Is he sort of in the middle? Do you sort of, going back to that first answer, I'd, I'd also mention in that bracket, someone like Rob Valentini plays for the Wallabies. He's sort of that similar dynamic player. Have England not quite got that, do you think? No, I, I don't think I don't think they do. Which which touches on what I was saying earlier about if if you don't have that, then you know, it, it, would it be better to change tack in the back row for England and just play three flankers? We know Ed, Eddie experimented with that before when Billy Vunapola was um, was he injured? I think he was injured, or was he just just out, out of form? I think I think he was injured when he had Tom Curry at eight. Um, I don't think from what we've seen, considering. Borthwick has hung his hat on Dombrand. I don't think he will do that, but I think that that day might come. Tom Willis um, has obviously been going great guns for Bordeaux, um, even in the snooze fest. Even it, well, well, actually, this is this is the funny thing. I, I don't think he had his greatest game last night okay. necessarily. But as I said, it wasn't a very good game, so it was very stop start. It was difficult for anyone to really to really properly impress. But obviously, with him playing for Bordeaux last night, that affects his chances of England selection quite drastically, you'd say, because he can't... Well, I mean, he could be at training. He wouldn't be able to train today, so therefore he wouldn't be able to train until Tuesday of a match on a Saturday when you don't really train on a Friday. So that's... And they have Wednesdays off, so that's two days' worth of training heading to England v Wales. Maybe he is the man to play number eight, but at the minute, it's, you know, logistically, it's looking like a bit of a Tom Willis nightmare. I think there's a few things to kind of take up with that question. I think they probably want a, a visa that'd be handy for most test teams for a start. Um, the, the second thing is I think England have looked at that, as, as Charles said, with, with Curry going to eight. Um, I think the third thing is to say that with Tom Curry back, we'll get a sense of exactly what Steve Borthwick wants. I think we know that I would, I would say that I totally disagree that it feels like England still want a bulldozer because they've got a bulldozing number eight still going pretty well in the Premiership in, in a bit of a Napoleon and he is being left out on what is clearly a selection call rather than an injury or, or a form call. Um, so they're going away from that. It's just to, to see who they, um, you know, who, who they who they who they fancy there. 
surveyor was one of the guys that Jones used to say that Tom Curry could play like. And actually, I remember a lot of Northampton fans saying, actually, isn't Lewis Ludlam the more kind of tenacious carrier and, and more comfortable in that in that side of the game? Which is why, another reason why I think he could be, he could be that number eight to complement a, um, a Willis Curry partnership. It's way too early, but let's set the uh, the hype train free. Chandler Cunning himself is he? Is he the long term kind of oh, bruiser uh, who kind of you I, know, I think one that they might want there. People a lot wiser than me um, have said that the kind of the the junior World Cup, the under twenties World Championship, sort of going away for a couple of years, stop players getting hyped up too early. <laughs> and he he's he's very impressive. He's a big carrier. He having interviewed him the other day, which you can read on our on our website. He relishes carrying he's a very very laid-back young man very personable um but he is seriously seriously aggressive on the pitch and he, he said that that's just that's one of the reasons I, I love this game is is because i really re- enjoy that contact area on both sides of the ball so he, he'd be somebody who um i don't know, give him a few years and and um and yeah and you know but i, I agree that um with charles tom tom willis seems potentially a kind of a hybrid of both really being able to kind of chuck through those chuck through those hard yards and also being a skillful link player as well I'm going to get a telling off from Declan Kidney for doing that but I mean you know he, he looks the business um, just a final question then to wrap up from Stephen and Charles I'll come to you on this because I know you reported on it it's just about the significance of Leicester needing that £13 million investment and and I guess people are interested in it mainly I mean obviously concerned about Leicester but also because if Leicester and needing that size of investment with the club, you know, with thousands of supporters coming up each week, what does it mean for the other clubs in the Premiership? So, so can you just tell us, for starters, what, sort of what that means and why that investment has come about? Sure. Um, so, with Leicester, I, I don't think there's any uh, imminent threat to to Leicester Tigers um, as a, as a rugby club. But but you're right, Colsey, in what you're saying that if if Leicester need this to stay off administrators, then then you know it does it, it does paint a bleak picture for the rest of the league. I, I, with 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 Leicester specifically, it would seem to be a cash a cash flow issue, where the restructuring of the fixture list and them losing two home games, both Worcester and Wasps, early on in the season back to back, has basically meant that they're somewhat out of pocket as things currently stand. Now there are. They are going to recoup those funds without a doubt because they six of their remaining eight matches this season, and that's if they don't progress um, past the European last 16, are all at home. So they are going to re- recoup those losses in the future. But at the minute, there is a cash flow issue with Leicester in that they would have budgeted for those home games at the start of the season. That DCMS loan is also due to start to be paid back soon. And basically what they're saying is that they're about to hit their overdraft. In the, in, they're going to hit their overdraft in the first quarter of 2023. Um, but they might not sort of recoup those losses from those home games from the redistributed fixture list until the end of this season. So they need a sort of urgent injection of funds, shall we say, mm. Um but it's not to say that the club is on the verge of going bust. It's that the club is sort of it has a cash flow problem because of the rejig season. Uh, you know, as we've been uh, recording this, we've had an email from Premiership Rugby about how they have the organisation has appointed Sir Nigel Boardman to lead a review of the club's finances. Um, Sir Nigel was a part, partner at Slaughter in May, um, and he's. He's been appointed to lead a review of the financial position of all current premiership clubs and the subsequent translation into financial regulation. There's also news here about a new sporting commission that the league is going to um, establish, which will take responsibility for key sporting decisions for the organisation. So I think there is a state of flux in the premiership at the minute. Um, I think there has been an awareness and an acceptance that something has to change and that more transparency is required. Um, And hopefully now these while these sort of things that are happening seem scary hopefully it means that there is no chance of a of a replication of Worcester and Wasps in the future right that's it for today a big thanks to Charlie and Charles as always and to Cheslin Colby and Josh Turnbull for their time as well the Six Nations resumes this weekend hopefully with a full set of fixtures 
In the meantime, there's more build-up to the weekend's action from all three of us, as well as expert analysis from the likes of Gavin Mayers, Will Greenwood and Brian Moore over on The Telegraph's website. If you've enjoyed this episode, please hit subscribe and let people know what a good time you've had wherever you're listening to us. We'll see you next week. Enjoy the games. Goodbye.